Our day-to-day -day life is defined by the networks within which we are embedded. Our friends, family, co-workers, and the people that they know as well. Looking out even further to our extended communities, modern city life is now not only facilitated by a myriad of networks, it's become entirely dependent on it. A network of infrastructure brings food, clothing, and more from producers to consumers. Transmission lines create a network of substations, transformers, and more that connect us to a generator that supplies the electricity we've become so dependent on. Perhaps the most relevant to you and I in this very moment, a network of computers and servers delivers entertainment, communication, and information to many of us, and livelihoods to an increasingly many more. Even within that entertainment, networks can be found, from relationship networks between characters of your favorite TV series, to type advantage networks in the Pokemon video games. And these are just a handful of examples of networks which we ourselves have established. The tip of the tip of the iceberg, if you will. Extending our search to the natural world, we'll find uncountably many more. The network of atomic bonds holding everything together. The food web which controls the availability of nutrition. And the metabolic network that converts that food into the energy that powers your body. I think you get the point. Networks are not only all around us, they've essentially come to define us. Formally speaking though, networks are really quite simple a set of nodes representing people, or computers, or anything really, is connected by a set of links, representing connections between these nodes. These connections can be literal, like copper wires or roads connecting cities, or they can be figurative, like friendship. And that's it. I mean, really, that's more or less all a network is. If we wanted to, we could summarize it in a single sentence. Network theory is the study of relationships. There are certainly complications that we can add on top, but I'd argue that in no other subdiscipline of mathematics could you encapsulate so much of the field in a single sentence as you could with network theory. So today, I want to take a math-free tour of network theory to see why networks arise, why we study them, what we can learn from them, and what they can teach us about nature and even ourselves. Suppose we were tasked with building infrastructure that would allow for communication between many individuals. For simplicity, we'll represent these people with these nodes. What's the network that best solves this problem? Different networks will of course come with their own pros and cons. Connecting every individual to every other seems like an obvious answer, but it's often prohibitively costly from a resource point of view, especially given that most pairs of people probably won't talk to each other very often if at all. The other extreme is not great either though. Ring networks like this are cheap resource-wise, but communication is much less efficient. Moreover, networks like this are extremely fragile. The loss of a single link because a tree fell over and cut a power line severely alters the ability for people to communicate. It's clear that neither extreme is ideal, and coming up with a network that balances the pros and cons is the game that individuals, companies, governments, and even nature have to play. In this sense, networks arise as the solutions to very complex optimization problems. It's the desire to communicate, balanced against the resources required to do so. Without more information about the specific problem, it's impossible to say that a particular network is the best one. After all, the number of possible networks that you could form with just 24 nodes exceeds the number of atoms in the universe. So there's a lot of possible networks to choose from. Because of this, network scientists are less interested in any one particular network and instead study categories, or what's often called network topologies. Networks sharing the same topology may not be the same, they may not even have the same number of nodes, but they share certain structural similarities. For example, out of these three networks, the third one here is clearly out of place. In other words, it's topologically different compared to the first two. Hopefully this makes some intuitive sense as well. The neural network inside your head is unique to you. But despite this, all of us function as human. In fact, rather than looking at the effect of diseases like Alzheimer's on the actual neural network, network neuroscientists study how these diseases alter the topology, or categorization, of an individual's brain. What's interesting, however, is the frequency with which some categories of networks are encountered in both nature and in human-constructed networks. 
Arguably, the most famous example of this are small world networks. I think many of us have experienced small world phenomena. The surprising discovery that a friend of a friend of yours knows a famous YouTuber or went to school with a popular musician. The six degrees of separation experiment and the Kevin Bacon number are also examples of small world phenomena. The way to tell a network is a small world one is by the presence of hub nodes. These hubs tend to be rare within a network, but they connect to many, many other nodes. Airports are probably the most intuitive example of hubs and small world networks. Rather than having flights connecting every city to every other city, all minor airports around the world connect to a few major ones like Heathrow or Los Angeles International. While certainly from a passenger's perspective layovers can be stressful, from an efficiency point of view the small world network formed by plane routes is the more desirable configuration. It's balance. It's the network that best balances the need to connect areas around the world with the resource required to do so. There are many other examples of small world networks, both artificial and natural. The internet, metabolite networks, and food webs, and many more. In fact, the answer to our initial question, what's the best way to link individuals who want to communicate, is often in part answered by small world networks. This is true even in nature. Studies have shown that neuron connections start off as random and then tend towards a small world network as they mature. I find this particularly interesting because it suggests that we can learn something about the nodes, meaning the things that we want to study, by looking at the network structures that they form and how they connect. We can hypothesize that neurons form small world networks because the brain requires a robust communication for information processing, but in the most energy efficient way. This line of thinking can be particularly interesting in the social sciences because it directly relates to our lived experiences. For example, in the 1930s, an early network study of elementary school students found friendship networks became more fragmented and less connected in the higher grades. Going further, network studies have again and again shown that people form associative networks, meaning people tend to form friendships with others who are similar to themselves. Observations like these lead us to ask, why? Why do we primarily form associative networks? Why do friendship networks fragment as we get older? Maybe the answer is that we prefer having a few strong connections over many weak ones. If that's the case, is this another example of a balance that we've reached in the face of some constraint? Maybe the time and patience that it takes for us to nurture strong relationships enforces a trade-off between the number of people we know and how well we'd like to know them. I think it's interesting to think about how these questions about ourselves can arise out of mathematics and logic. Networks are theoretically simple objects, but we know that even simple things coming together can generate complexity. Despite how much we've covered here, I've left out quite a lot, some of which I hope to visit in future videos. The beauty of network theory really is how approachable yet applicable it is. There are very few scientific fields in which a social scientist, a business person, and an engineer can so easily contribute to each other's research. As a related story, a few years ago, I remember coming across an interesting blog post. Using network theory, the author deduced mathematically who was the main character of the Star Wars movies. I remember a week later, I found a network-based analysis of the relationships between members of different K-pop groups. I don't think I can emphasize how much this shocked me at the time. It wasn't because it was Star Wars or K-pop, but because it was math. Rigorous, legitimate, applicable math that was being applied to something so, for lack of a better word, silly, but also down to earth. I couldn't help but feel that if this down to earthiness was how we taught math in high school, encouraging students to study connections that were important to them in their own lives, no one would graduate from high school asking what good mathematics is in the real world.